instead of judging and being narrow-minded about uh, looking at something and going, oh, that's acceptable, but that isn't uh, in terms of nature, um, then you realise that what we've done collectively over a long period of time to this planet and to the wildlife and to ourselves, psychologically, physically and uh, and emotionally, um, it's a wonder we're here at all. That was John Farris, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. Here at The Regenerative Journey, we know that good health is related to good food and good practices, but understand that sometimes the right food choices are quite hard to put into place. But our good buddy, Cindy O'Meara at the Nutrition Academy is helping people break old habits to create a much healthier lifestyle. So in support of what she's doing, we're offering a $100 discount to all our listeners. Simply enroll in their functional nutrition course and enter the coupon CHARLIE100, that's CHARLIE100, the Nutrition Academy, say goodbye to old food habits and hello to a much healthier, happier life. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally and their continuing connection to country, culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an eighth generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series, I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. And this week's episode is with Johnny Farris, the drummer from NXS, the world famous rock and roll band. Um, I've known Johnny for a few years. We sat here, we are sitting here uh, at his beautiful property in the northern rivers of New South Wales. <laughs> no, that's good, mate. This is good. This is. I like it. I just saw Charlie sitting at his microphone. That's all right. That's <laughs> but um, I hope you enjoy this uh, this fantastic interview with Johnny Farris as much as I did. Mate, we're on. All right. Look, big red record button. Big red record. Um, Johnny Farris, this is The Regenerative Journey. Thank you for being um, my latest victim mm. on the show. <laughs> okay. I've been, well, thanks for the heads up. For those who are listening and watching, um, Johnny's given me a few little tips already. He can't help himself, and I very much appreciate the the um, the audio tips because ah. I'm a I'm a no, I'm a novice, mate. I'm a, I'm a real novice. We're well, looking you're... pretty professional with all this equipment. <laughs> um, you know, lots of I mean, I've got to say, um, that Charlie, I didn't expect to see you rock up with pelican cases full of field recording equipment, which is very impressive. <laughs> well, um, mate, I'm you know I I'm, I'm take this I take this. I take this. Um, now you just turn this right around already, haven't you? You're clever. Um, but I'll just say that I, I take this job, not this job, this activity, this this love of mine, very seriously. And to capture mm. the um, the dulcet tones of yourself and other guests is really, is really important to mm. me. Mm. And I do feel a bit undercooked, though, <laughs> given oh. given what you've brought to the to the party already. Well, you know, I mean, look, um, I think it's fascinating, and um, we were blessed to have met through um, just friends, mm. you know, but, and through that, um, understanding, you know, what you're doing with uh, regenerative farming and, and, I, and I recognize that as being a holistic um, philosophy across, you know, the board with, with life and understanding that. And then I attended one of your bio, bioregenic, bioregenerative, biodynamic, biodynamic yeah. big pardon. We could start calling it that though. Okay. <laughs> but um, clearly I failed uh, <laughs> that course. Not you're even getting in like the name failed, of it, right? You failed, you failed the spelling course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can talk about spelling too. It's a weird one. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, so um, for me to have attended one of those wonderful seminars where Hamish mm. um, was, um, you know, doing the, 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 the main talking and you know it was really fantastic I learned a lot and met some interesting people um, and that was just a wonderful leg up to 
realised that the move we'd made from the city to the, the country and committed to owning, you know, some property, albeit not that big in terms of, you know, real serious farming with 100 acres, uh, it's still something to manage and get your head around. And, and that move and then to meet you and, and other like-minded people um, and attend that, that um, regen course or the biodynamic course was just fantastic. And, I, and, I've, and I've, I really want to preempt this discussion by saying that there's so many parallels that we can, you know, attribute um, to that course, which, you know, bleeds through every, every part of our lives. Mate, you've just kicked it off. You're going straight to the guts of it, which I love. I'm just going to knock it back a gear. Um, we're going to get back to all of that. Cool. But, but what, while we, where we are is, an, and you're, I'm honoured and, and very, very, you know, um, grateful that, that we're sitting in your home, your private piece of paradise, really, mm. and why I sit here with my guests in their happy places is to get to the crux of why 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 are they here and what 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 is it that that keeps you here like what mm. what, are we, what are we looking at and, and right. why is that sort of a, a place you want to be in sure well just to give um the listeners a little bit of a background of, of my life um i taught myself to play drums um at a very young age um i had two older brothers who uh had learnt guitar and and piano um, I'd learnt piano too at a very young age, but um, I segued across to drums because it was sort of competitive to get the piano space uh, in the house. Um, but uh, that was fantastic. And through that journey of music and building a world around something which I kind of taught myself and, and was deeply passionate about, um, got me, you know, away from home really quickly. So I was, I was, I was away from home. Uh, 17 years old and, and from that uh, from Perth, Perth yeah. yeah across to Sydney and then from there a couple of years later in excess were just touring internationally and so I was living in hotels uh, it was all very flash and glamorous um, as flash and glamorous as that really can be and it sounds like it's flash and glamorous but actually isn't <laughs> but um, there were ups and there were downs, but I'm sure there were some flash. Bits. There were some very flash bits, <laughs> lots of flashing as well. <laughs> but the thing is that you know, with all that excitement, and it was really built for someone who's in their 20s and 30s, which is perfect because that's how old I was. But as it started to get into the 30s and the 40s, and of course the 50s, um, you know, world's changing. Um, the world and the global climate's changing. The the the, the whole thing is just evolving. And uh, with that comes changes. Uh, and so it became very clear um, after all those years of touring that while I enjoyed big cities and it was really exciting, I lived in Hong Kong for 12 years, you know, I, 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 like, I like big cities. Really? But, mm, but, I, but I also really always was really homesick for Australia. I was always homesick, um, even though we were away for a good nine, ten months a year minimum for many, many years. I was always enjoying being on tour, but I always missed being home. And so where we are now to get back to your, you know, question here at our home, um, this is the antidote to my career and my life is to, when I, you know, can, and when I get the opportunity, I take it to sit here and just look at all the trees and listen to the birds and really meditate on, on what it is that, that we've got, you know, I mean, we as the human race on this planet and, um, so after seeing both sides of, you know, really frenetic lifestyle and um, excitement and, and pressure and, and wild times, um, I'm now sort of the inversion of that <laughs> these days. So, but, but that's what, I mean, that's what the, this show is about, though, Johnny, yeah. is, you know, it's about digging into the, and you, and you might have said it before, the rebirth, you know, yep. or the, the, the regeneration. And yeah. There are chapters in people's lives that... Cycles, yeah. Cycle, absolutely yeah. cycles. And, and, and there's probably more cycles in people's lives than they probably um, really understand. But yep. that's that's what this is all about, is is um, understanding, you know, like turning points, tips, tricks, you know, for our listeners to sort of go, you know what, I'm, I wasn't doing that with Johnny or, but I can, I can kind of, I can see where that was a, a turning point. And then it's about our listeners learning something really, Sure, you know, and it's not just about historical learning yep. about you. It is, but it's also about, you know, 
let life lessons. Sure. I mean, there's hopefully takeaways with any discussion with anyone mm. because what I've learned um, or allowed to, to learn, because that's a very important difference between being taught something and actually allowing yourself to learn it mm. um, experientially or just pondering on it, but um, is that is, is to, you know, appreciate what, what discussions are had and, and what the takeaways are. Sometimes you can be talking about something um, completely unrelated to what you're interested in, but there was something in there that, that you know, someone can um, identify with. And, and that's that little parallel, that, that little crossover where people, you know, that's what it's all about is, is that, I guess, the community on people connecting and, and sharing, whether they know they're sharing or not some kind of takeaway which is that that whole amazing um divine you know uh, construct that we live in which is all about interconnectivity and, and that's the same with music the whole, same thing let's go back in time a little way <clears throat> your was there i mean it just could go anywhere and mm. that's wonderful that we've got that opportunity was there a time was there a time when that was – was there a time when that, that, that occurred to you, right? Because you're, you know, call it distraction, you're in rock and roll, you're in hotel rooms, you're, you know, you're performing, you're touring. You know, when did – was there a point at which – was it a wake up in one morning moment? Was it a, um, <clears throat> a slow, slow burn until you got to that point? Was there anything that sort of like pushed you over the edge and went, oh, my God, you know, is more to it than oh, sure. hotel rooms? Sure. Look – all of the above, um, I, I feel very blessed because since a very young age, I, I was always pondering things which I don't think the average kid was pondering. I mean, um, I just assumed that I was thinking just the way other people would think. <clears throat> um, and I guess what I'm saying is that I, I was quite an abstract, deep thinker uh, and would go very, very deep into my thoughts about anything that I experience and how to file it um, and how to process it. Um, and along the way, um, as we all are uh, in, in, well, in this Australian Western society, you know, you go to school, you know, and when I was growing up in the sixties and seventies, it was pretty standard stuff. You know, um, you went to school, you know, if you're lucky enough, you had a television, you watch that every now and then. And, yeah, you know, and, and um, there were cultural things. There was sport and there was the radio and, and it, it, there was a format that you just were born into and you just walk the walk and you do it. And at some point you start to sort of go, you know, maybe there's other ways of thinking about this or, or the, the, the choices we're making or the choices that are made for us that we hadn't really considered why we're doing what we're doing. Why do we accept what we do as being the way it is and that's, that, that's it, mate? That's all there is to it. You know, I mean, I was always kind of questioning that stuff, which led me to get interested in um, alternate philosophies and um, just, you know, I think through music especially and teaching myself how to play instruments, having that liberal way of thinking allowed me and gave me uh, and um, help me construct a headspace where I could think about whatever I wanted to without the feeling of shame or ridicule or guilt or, um, you know, judgment. Um, and simply that was a, a, a place I could go and be creative. Uh, and that would just be a huge, big, um, you know, cooking pot to ponder and think about things which I... I really believe most people really weren't thinking about at the time. So I could start to see very clearly early on that there was a difference between the career path I'd chosen because it was simply a reflection of all the, the thoughts and the projections I had put in place that came to me because I'd put those projections into place. Not because um, I was told that if I do this course and I go to that school and I, then I would get this job and then that would be good for me and then I'd climb this ladder and then and then what you know so it on one hand I felt like I was a complete outsider and outcast mm. and on the other 
side of things, I felt extremely blessed and liberated to know that um, it's okay to be comfortable having um, to not being completely secure all the time. You know, it's okay to take risks and feel that maybe you know, uh, while it's a bit scary and wild, uh, that anything could happen at any moment, which it did. I, I got very comfortable with that, and that was my that was my safe space. Actually, was to be kind of in a in a wild and dangerous environment. Um, is that hmm. is that? Do you think that's the that's the journey of the musician? Is that a, is that a, is that a sort of a, with your colleagues or you know just your sense of it? Is that is is the expression of oneself in music? Um, is that you know? Is that just you? Or is that just a, is a bit of a theme? Your, right, your sure. band colleagues, your brothers, your you know your was it sort of were they expressing these sort of things as well? Hmm. I think some of us were, and some, look, it's like anything. You know, um, people like to categorize and catalog mm. and typecast and you know um, typeset everything into categories. You know, and that's to say that even within the musician realm, you know, there's there's a keyboard player. You know, there's a bass player guy, you know, there's a drummer guy. There's, oh, he's a drummer, you know, or, or he's a singer or she's a singer or whatever. And there are those categorizations and you can, you know, uh, pigeonhole all these things. And then it goes out the broader, you know, um, uh, thing on the radar, which could be what type of musician are you? Are, are you uh, are you sort of just into the vanity of, of being on stage and th- throwing your hair around, which, which I've explored and it's great fun, actually. <laughs> but especially with a mullet. Um, but <laughs> an aggressive mullet. <laughs> really, really good mullet. Um, but um, but also, you know, recognizing that yeah, um, you could be a musician and that could just be enough for you, you know. But yeah. for me, being a musician was was well, it was all about the art and, and the art was a way of expressing myself and that ultimately was was all I was doing, was really expressing mm. myself. And sharing that expression with other people, and then when we all synced up and got completely, you know, in in what we call in the pocket together, mm. then that that exponential leap into that experience of having a fine tuned group of musicians who've just, you know, practiced and performed so many times that you've you become it becomes its own a whole other power force. That when you enter into that realm, you go, "Whoa, okay, this is really different." You know, now we're really um, taking it to a whole new level. So you're in you're in flow, as Adam yeah. Gibson would say. Okay, yeah. So in that flow. that's that that, especially when when you're performing um, a piece of music that you're familiar with, or even if you're not familiar with it, you still get in the zone. I mean, mm. the, the, what you do is you 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 end up in, in a trance state. Actually, you become in a meditative state, and What's really interesting about that, and I'll just make mention to it because I am a drummer, and one of the crafts um, being a drummer is is to keep tempo. Now I, I was very, um, you know, probably hard on myself because I, I would always hear fluctuations in tempos, and I was always a bit cross with myself that I wasn't in your in your in, tempo in, in my own tempo. Yeah, because yeah. I'm sort of holding that 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 groove, yeah. the, the rest of the band sort of playing around. And if I could feel that I was rushing a certain part or I was lagging a certain part, I'd get down on myself a bit and go, come on, we're going to tighten this up a bit. So, uh, and that was around about the time that um, computer-generated uh, drum machines were introduced to the market and it, it was looked upon as being this big threat to musicians. And I thought, no, they're great. It's just another tool, you know. Mm. This sounds really cool. It's another texture. And what I did was start to play along with these computers um, and I became locked in with this machine. That, that was one of the styles that I developed was was kind of almost uh, ironically, and we'll get to the ironic part later, hopefully in this discussion, but is about getting locked in with a machine so that my tempo was so bang on that we could augment um, some of the sounds and, and the instruments with computers. And that became another part of the band, if that mm. makes sense. I mean, I was running that stuff. But what I'm getting at is... Um, that when you're in the flow and you're really in the zone, um, you have this moment of where you're experiencing that you're outside of time, that all of a sudden you're in the now and you're in the present, even though the time is flowing on a linear direction. Mm. You've actually suspended that, that, that limitation and you're actually in the moment. And that 
I, I can say I've experienced that on many, many, many times in front of thousands of people um, on a daily basis. Um, and I'm just so lucky and gifted to, to know what that feels like. But I, I find it very difficult to do it in my normal, just day-to-day living. You know? uh, and that's why I guess that there are meditation practices and that there's disciplines that have evolved over thousands of years to, to help people achieve that. But, mm. Well, I guess in, in that instance, you're, you're, you're in the flow with other people, aren't you? There's, a, there's, yeah. a, there's a, you know, not a reliance. Well, there is a reliance on because you, you're still in that, you're in that sort of state and there's a, an expectation and there's a, there's a synergy that's happening there. That's right. And that's a, it's a really good point. It, like, it might take something to get to that point and there's a lot of coordination and you've all got to be on, on that day. You've got to right. be on point. And right. I guess when you're there, then maybe you, you're that, that is a maintaining of that because it's like that's the team. But when, as right. you say, in your domestic life, you're outside of that industry life, that I imagine would be challenging if, if your standard of flow state is with your buddies right. on the – on the you know on the skins, yeah. then how does you, how do you or how does one create their own flow state as an individual? Right. Well, and of course, um, what you're saying is is a really good point, and that is you know that you're you're experiencing that it's fellowship you're experiencing with other people, and not only are you as a band or a group of musicians doing that with the musicians and that focus is suddenly all aligned and, 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 you know, um, so there were six of us and, you know, six guys equals, you know, 60,000, you know, one plus one plus one plus one plus, you know, whatever amount equals six really is more than the sum of, of, of the individuals. It's, it's exponential. So Mm -hmm. when you hit this sort of point where you're experiencing this incredible, um, uh, experience of, of being in the moment and uh, having incredible focus and you're you're observing it you know so you you're with six people on the stage totally being scrutinized you know by thousands of people you've got a crew each side of you uh, and obviously there's there's lots behind the scenes that are happening so all that's functioning as well and the audience is kind of in the zone with you at the same mm. time so there's this whole fellowship experience this exchange of of, I would put it down to as key points, bullet points would be trust, um, acceptance, um, and um, being vulnerable. Mm. Uh, and those are really powerful elements because when you're able to just trust everything's fine, that's when you're able to reach, you know, um, a, a greater state of, of awareness um, because you're, you're letting go. You know, you're not being you're not being confined by all the noise in your head that, that's chirping away at you that, that gives you doubt or that provides reasons for you not to be in that state. And, and you're doing that in front of tens of Yeah, tens exactly. Of so you're, you're, you're a bit on show. Oh, absolutely. And look, I mean, while it can be... I make references to, um, you know, tennis players when you've got these amazing, um, incredible, talented tennis players mm. and there's, you know, one pitted against the other. Now, there's usually an outcome where someone wins and someone loses. But on stage, you know, you'd have to fluff pretty bad to lose, uh, you know, <laughs> because it's your show and, and they're your audience. So you usually got to peg your, your, to your advantage, you know what I mean? Do you ever get booed off? Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, not not <laughs> sometimes. Early, maybe early, early years? <laughs> um, yeah, oh, yeah, I think we did, actually. Uh, it's, well, we got heckled. Uh, <laughs> How rude. He- heckled. How rude. I remember we did a, a gig in um, New York or Long Island or somewhere early in our career. It was in 1983 mm. or something. It was 10,000 people or maybe more mm. who were supporting the Kinks. Oh, yeah. And um, I think they were kind of, you know, got back together for this tour and we were just starting our, you know, big touring career and, and uh, we were perhaps a little, um, a little unruly for that conservative audience, mm. let's put it who were probably, you know, they were elderly, like my age, you know. Um, but at the time, back <laughs> You're in the early, not <laughs> Stop it. But at the time, <laughs> uh, back, back in the early 80s, you know, um, you know, we came out bombastic Australians um, with lots to prove uh, and, you know, Michael would run out and try and excite the audience to mm. sort of get them to stand up and, and wake up and everything, you know. Um, and then, yeah, we had a few people that sort of went, oh, you guys, you know, you suck. 
get off, man. We want the kinks. But I mean, that's about all I could remember anything um, untoward like that. But but what I'm getting at about in, in, in the in, in, on stage with an audience and being able to achieve a kind of a state of, um, you know, an altered state, really, a heightened sense of awareness. Um, you're 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 fully doing what you're doing as a musician. So you're remembering all the um, arrangements, you're executing the parts, you're kind of also ad-libbing a little bit. Um, you're in the moment because each audience is different, each venue is different, and every moment's different. So you're rolling with the punches and sometimes you get, I mean, well, not sometimes, but it's all about curveballs. You know, you constantly get thrown a curveball and then rolling with it, like it's not going to interrupt your, your state, your flow. So you tend to roll with those curveballs and that becomes the show. Is and, being and able to, that's, yeah. that's a sense of unknown or the sort of, this could go a bit pear-shaped, right. but this is the, I'm up for the challenge. Right. Exactly. And that, that's the point I'm, I'm coming into is, is that raises edge is where all the fun is. Mm. Because you're, already, you, you, you're unbuckling your seatbelt and, and you, you're going and you're, you're just walking into it and going, well, this isn't, this is really awesome. You know, this isn't as, as scary as it appears. It's like anything. It, it's, you know, if, you, if you're um, worrying about something, then you're, you're, you're spending a lot of time about an event that's on its way, you know. Uh, and then when the event happens, it's a completely different outcome. And you could have been preparing for the event as opposed to worrying about the event. Yeah, well, all those times that mm. where you were worrying about, and that's the whole thing, the, 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 you know, um, f philosophical mystics talk about is mm. being in the moment. And we were just talking about being in the moment. But, but you know, as they say, worrying uh, works because uh, 99% of the time what you worry about doesn't, doesn't happen. So, mm. <laughs> so, so um, I'm just saying that you, you can... You can create an outcome by worrying about it so much that you've actually drawn that outcome into into your existence because you've you've meditated on on the worry more than the outcome you want. And to um, in in the world of permaculture, Johnny, the, mm. there's a there's a, a phrase that probably you know life is a you know it's called the edge effect. Mm -hmm. That you know on the edge of different zones in permaculture, you might have a forest zone and a a cropping zone. Okay, you know it's on that edge where right diversity is right meets diversity these yeah. two things sort of right. diverse entities themselves meet and an interesting yeah. interesting thing interesting things happen yeah and there's that phrase you know if you're not living on the edge you're taking up too much space <laughs> <laughs> that's fascinating i love it that's awesome and what a brilliant what a brilliant analogy because if you look at it's not a single it's not a simple line is it i mean it's mm. not like a, a line you draw and go there's a boat boat you know, a biome that side and there's a biome that side and there's yeah. a line and nothing crosses over. Well, at the point you're talking about, that point of, of, of um, crossover, mm. um, there's some magical stuff happening there. Well, that's like, I mean, mm. you, six, six of you guys, mm. six crossovers, mm. I mean, you know, more, because right. there's always we other interactions. More and nodes, no, wonder, yeah. no wonder things um, cranked up. Just back to yeah. um, your early days, the was there a point at which you remember that you as a support act were bigger than the main act? Was oh, yeah, like, plenty. Yeah. Uh, well, that was the part of the wild ride is that largely, uh, and, and thanks to Chris Murphy, who passed on sadly earlier this year, um, who was just, you know, effectively the seventh member of the band, mm. um, Chris Murphy, our manager. Um, although we parted ways uh, during the 90s, we got back together again in a different capacity. But... Um, his his uh, contributions to an excess were massive because he enabled us to get on with what we do best, and that is the music, the performances, um, and and just or anything to do with the arts, artistic side of things, the musical side of things. What he enabled us to do was recognise not to get hung up at all about status and and you know what part of the bill you're on and, and how big your name is on the on the poster it says you, and there's and we, we learned early on to get the psychology right behind what see if you if you if you've already accepted that you're enjoying what you're doing and you love what it is then there's no problem right mm. and the minute that you allow that whatever happens is meant to be 
then you've already won because you're not hung up about that much. And if you can visualize that you can be as successful or as big as you want, just be careful what you wish for because you're going to get it. And is that what you want? You know, mm. I think that deep down we all knew that we had a good shot at this. So I'd already visualized and, and um, experienced it in a metaphysical sense way, way back. So I was already relaxed that that wasn't an issue. So to get to your point, sometimes we would take a lower slot in, a, in an event for more tactical reasons, for the simple purpose that there was someone who was kind of edgy or champing at the bit to, to headline it over us. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, we wanted to do, we want, you know, just to, you know, we want to be playing after an excess. So we're fine. If anyone has got the balls to play after an excess, you, you know, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that'll learn you. <laughs> kind of. And I know it sounds arrogant in a way. And of course it is. But, but, but that was the mindset. It's mm. like, you know, we're out to just kill and destroy. Yeah. Our performance was about just bringing an audience to a climax. And so, you know, usually and depending on the crafting of, of the, um, the, the artists on, let, let's say we're talking about a festival or whatever, where there's more than, say, two acts, mm. um, where you're slotted into that, that day depends on the other artists, what type of music they are, what sort of audience you're expecting, what is the climate of the, of the, of the, the venue, um, what, what are the weather uh, dynamics going to be like, what time does the sun set? What time does the moon rise? Which mm. direction? Whereabouts in, in the relationship to the stage is the sun mm. and, and the moon? And, how, and what effect will that have at the transition as people go through a long day and they may have had a few drinks or a, a yoin tour or whatever they're into, right? Um, and then they might be having a dip around about 6 p.m. as the sun's setting late. And then they kind of perk up afterwards. And so you've got to kind of pick and try and figure out where are the best places with that frequency those ebb and flows of, of a day's event would, would we be best to to if we had the option of course to be put on in, into the uh the festival or, or lineup um so sometimes the headline position may not have been tactically the best position to have sometimes yeah. it's better to have a band who are a lot more established a lot um and, and respectfully so um been around longer and have more sort of draw power to definitely please go on after us you know um and then that could be the same put on on us as well it could be a big act that that um would want to go before us and we were like well hang on what's what's the the play here so i'll just rattle off a couple mm. of of interesting um outcomes which happened because things were happening so quickly in the 80s that we would be booking a gig six months ahead or four months ahead and in that six or four months, a, a whole bunch of things could change. Mm. So, for example, we did a gig um, in somewhere like Port Kembla or somewhere or, or Shell Harbour or somewhere around there mm. where I think a, and a band called Men at Work supported us. And the, book, uh, the booking was done months before. And while they were supporting us at this small gig, they were number one in America. <laughs> Oh, so yes. it goes to show you who saw that coming yeah. and their booking agent and everything was all locked in. So yeah. at this point, look, I can't even remember who went first. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's insignificant. But the point I'm saying is that's one great example of how you've got a status at one minute mm -hmm. and then two weeks later, you can have a completely different sort of uh, dynamic status. But an, another couple of good examples would be Guns N' Roses. We, when we got to the point where we had, um, you know, we're starting to pull big audiences and we're pulling uh, for, you know, stadium size audiences in America. Uh, and we, we, we booked um, Dallas, uh, Texas Stadium. So we're in what, the late 80s, early 90s? Probably 85, 86, oh, okay. somewhere around there. Um, and, um, you know, yeah, but around 86. And, you know, this is 60,000 something people. This is, uh, and, and Texas Stadium is, um, a prestigious a venue, especially for the Texans, because, and the reason why their stadium had the big hole in it 
so that God can see their football team play, is what they say. <laughs> so, awesome? Yeah. And um, so it was a big gig, you know, full on. And Guns N' Roses were booked as our support act uh, with the Iggy Pop. Really? And by the time the gig came around, and, you know, I guess the agents and managers didn't see that coming, but Guns N' Roses just shot straight up. So they, were, they were really selling out uh, big numbers mm-hmm. themselves and they were kind of committed to the gig. And regretfully, unlike, I guess, us, um, we would have been totally cool if um, it had been the other way around. But, and I don't really want to make a point of this, is, is um, um, about Guns N' Roses because I thought they were pretty cool guys, you know, but, but their performance on the day, I thought, was really crap because um, Axl Rose was so mm. poo-poo about supporting a band that he felt, you know, he was now beyond that. Yeah. Mm. And kicking things around and beating up the stage and carrying on like a little, like, you know, a, a little sport brat. Mm. Um, and I just thought that was just a waste of a great opportunity to, to grab that moment. To, to support an excess at the Texas Stadium and show the crowd what a true professional band can look like. But instead, they chose the the other option, which is to carry on like a bunch of brats and play like crap and, mm. and they acted like a, 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 a sour support band. When mm. they were, when they were, the reason they were upset was that they wanted to be considered a headline act. So you just look at that example and think well what, what is that you know a different mentality altogether. Yeah, yeah you know and the audience sort of all they want to do is have a good time they don't really care yeah. you know? so i'm just saying it's just funny how it can get silly sometimes um well i'm not surprised it's yeah. a pretty you know ego driven industry i imagine that, uh, <laughs> is that be, that'd be fair to say johnny surely is <laughs> yeah and, and and other other times um we've done some performances with um you know, incredible artists i mean we we headlined rio de janeiro um Rock and Rio, and there's 125,000 people easy at mm. this gig, right? Um, and the support act for us was Billy Idol and Santana Fitting. in Brazil. So you'd think Santana, you know, being South American mm. or, or Central American and having you know, the Latin um, mm. contingent would have had priority. But somehow in the machinations of, of behind the scenes and the agents and managers, Agreed that that was the, the, the right lineup. And so, uh, how was Billy Arnold? Did you, you, what was, he's was great. It, he's Billy. He, is he nuts? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's nutty as any of us. Um, <laughs> I didn't really hang out much with Billy. I, rem- I, I remember seeing Billy when he was touring through Australia and he was, you know, his peak in the 80s. Yeah. And man. he he was a good act. I mean, he, he had his act down and, and, you know, he'd be out doing his curled lip and his, yeah. you know, that kind <laughs> of sexy famous. rock look that if you did it now, I'd kind of look like he's, he had a stroke or something but, <laughs> oh, oh. and he's peroxide here. yeah peroxide but here. it was great it was he was basically um one of the, the few people that came out of the rock scene uh the punk mm. the genuine punk london punk scene that was associated you know with the as far as i'm aware the malcolm mclaren kind of sex pistols movement um he went mainstream though, didn't he <laughs> yeah kind of yeah i mean he 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 popularized it you know mm. he 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 got it and formatted it and uh and and did well and it made some great, great pop music. Um, we want to. I want to get on a farm. You had hmm. another question about your time in in the band. Yeah. What, was there? I mean, you had a role to play, um, keeping the tempo as a musician hmm. in that band with your instruments. Was there another role you played in that band that wasn't necessarily with the use of an instrument? Was there sort of a? Sure. Well, 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 well I mean, the whole. Well, you know, the band in excess is a family. Um, because it's three brothers. I'm the youngest out of the band and youngest out of the family of Farris brothers. Um, but we all had roles, you know. I mean, everyone's role, even if being in the room and not having a role was a role because your presence, you know, as Carl Jung says, you can't sit and observe something without, um, you know, affecting your surroundings. So we all had a role regardless of what it was, its title was or, or whatever, but but we all had different things. My, my, um, some of my talents outside of drumming were um, some songwriting skills, um, programming, computer um, uh, sequencing. I got early on in the late 80s when our personal computers were available. Uh, I got right into that and started to dabble with um, constructing sequencing and um, songs uh, 
writing and that helped me with production and so became kind of good at production and producing. But my, my uh, passions were into the um, live production side of things as well. So I was really into uh, sound and, and all the equipment and really enjoyed the lights and the PA and I got really close with the, with the crew and I was kind of like almost like the liaison with the, the crew guys and mm. I was sort of... Um, and I always used to draw analogies, even though I had nothing to do with the military at any point in my life, except walk around with camo gear on when I'm on the farm. That's about <laughs> the, cl- the closest thing I've ever had to, to any... Um, Colonel. To, to, Colonel. Barely, uh, more like private. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, is that uh, we were a bit like a military operation, and that is that, um, you know, you have a crew, you've got a support ground crew, you've got an advanced team, you've got... Um, you know, people who advance the show and then you've got a uh, crew who advance the, 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 the production and then, then the crew arrive and then the band arrives and then it's a, it's a whole mm. operation. So I really enjoyed the logistics of that and watching it uh, when it was, you know, rehearsed and, and triple rehearsed and quadruply rehearsed. It was, you know, when you get that down to a fine-tuned um, system and every every person's involvement was important, you know. So, you know, I, I like the camaraderie of, of it. I really wasn't just the band and then the rest of us. It was all of us, you know, all of us, including the audience. Every mm. person involved who was there at some point and whatever capacity made it happen. Mm. That That's the point, you know, is that... And each one is so individual. Yeah. Each gig, each, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was, it was amazing to, to witness and, and be part of it and enjoy it, not only um, for all the wonderful, um, you know... Um, things that, that come along with it, the perks, but, but to be able to recognize that there's so much more to be, to be grateful for everything that happened, you know, every, just, just everything, just the, the people, um, who, who were there, um, the audiences were awesome. Um, and you know, it just brings the best out of people and sometimes the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine we might have to have an, I don't know, adults only version of this <laughs> for that part um johnny i want to start exploring your more of your journey um mm. i mean we're on a farm your farm mm. the beautiful and that's you know 100 acres is a reasonably sized farm up here where we are mm. that's that's something to scoff at mm. um not, not that you were suggesting that but mm. where was where i mean what was the impetus for that like where there's 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 a there's some there's a gap between the band and life in that industry and are sitting here now. Yeah. What what happened in the main in the in the middle there that might have you've gone, you know, mm. farming farm, land sanctuary. Yeah, I mean, I'd always intended to um, end up with land somewhere. Um, it had always been a, a goal and a dream of mine to um, be able to just walk out on my own property and just disappear wherever I want to. Um, but. It was also rather impractical to some extent because um, I found that when I was in my touring mode, I wanted to remain um, nimble and be near an airport. Um, and um, while there were times when I had the option to have, you know, uh, maybe more than one residence, I really just preferred to have one. And so I chose the city because we were traveling a lot, still were it really until we finished touring in 2012. So it's been 10 years, nine to 10 years, coming up to 12, mm. 12 uh, 10 year Delta coming up next year. Um, but um, with the, so I always intended to, to um, enjoy land. And then I watched Andrew and Tim, my brothers, and also Kirk, who was in the, in the group, enjoy acreage and farming. And it was through them that I was able to watch over their shoulders and, and sort of see what they're doing and, and kind of, I, I got, I understood it, you know, and I got a l- little bit of hands on and got my hands dirty every now and then when I was there, my, my mum and dad were managing Tim's farm. Um, this is in the late eighties as well, early nineties. Um, so it was, it was always going to happen. It's just that it was a question of where and, and I thought I was going to be further south. We were, you know, my wife, Kerry and I, we, we, we bought up in uh, Jervis Bay and we were living, you know, sort of suburban block, but we're on the water and it was beautiful. And, and you know, while my brothers were the farming guys, I was sort of more like after living in Hong Kong and, and, and spending a lot of time in Thailand, I was more like, I'm going to grab, you know, beach towel and go to the beach. 
and that was kind of what I enjoyed with knowing that at some point I want to get some land. So what we did was we sold up uh, in Jervis Bay and we sold up in Sydney and we moved up to the Byron hinterland. So we had the best of both. We had a beach, which is really close. Mm. We were close to Carrie's parents, which is really important because we've got two children now. And um, we, we started to look for land right when the whole of Byron was just going nuts. Mm. I mean, it was just ballistic. So 20, I was looking for land for 20, 2015, 2016, so two years, two something years to find something. And during that, that, that time, it was just going crazy. It went up 33%. The market went up thirty three percent while I was looking. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and that was five, yeah. that was six years ago. Yeah, and 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 it must have it must have come off the ball there for, for a while, didn't it? Mm. Well, it was sort of very hard. There was no metric to index anything mm. um, because people were making up prices. And um, I know we're getting off track a little bit real estate market, but but it's, but it's interesting journey because while you know we want to be on land, um, you know. It's not that easy, you, you, you know. You got to pick up an area. You, you got to, you know, what's the climate? What's what's everything about? What, what's the, you know, what's the community stand for? What, you know, and so we were homeschooling. I, I use that term we lightly. My wife was homeschooling our two children. We both agreed that that was uh, the right environment for them. Uh, so in Sydney, we were homeschooling our kids, mm -hmm. and so it seemed um, just a, a natural step to move up to the Byron area where we recognize there was more liberal um, and independent thinking types up here and we'd probably fit in better because um, you know we're not normal run-of-the-mill folk um, and uh, we can continue with the homeschooling on on land and that that was for us a, a super important um, thing for our kids and us and what was it about this block did you did you drive in and go oh my god this is it or did you go oh no I have to come back six times was there, was, <laughs> you were drawn to this yeah, I was, uh, well, I had fairly hefty um, criteria lists and that made it difficult because obviously, um, you, know, you know, with the briefing I was giving agents, um, hey, that's a pretty hefty list you want of, of <laughs> outcomes. With, with, you know, I, I wanted a You're too of, hard to work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I wanted water. So I wanted running water. I wanted a river or a creek or something. That was number one, really. Um, privacy was my next big thing and for Kerry and I, m mainly for me, I just wanted privacy. I, I just really wanted to be able to just drive through the gate and um, leave it all back at the gate mm. and um, know that we can pretty much all be liberal and, and do whatever we want and not be um, judged or, you know, told to turn it down or anything mm. like that. So that was important. And a lot of other things were like, we wanted a view and we just wanted trees. Mm. Um, so we got all those things and uh, and a lot more than we bargained for in terms of the trees, <laughs> like a lot of trees. Yeah, but that's, so, a, that's, well, a, such, a, yeah. that's a wonderful asset. It's not, it's not a bush though, is it? Cause no. We're looking, actually, I might just turn that Some little thing this. around for a show the peeps. Can I do that? Sure. Just do that. <laughs> just see what we're looking at. You can see trees, beautiful. It's not all trees. There's some beautiful grassy paddocks out there. Yeah, there's some pasture um, across the hill. So we're looking across at our own um, property. Um, there were a lot of established trees already, which is great. Uh, problem up here, of course, is we've got a lot of camphor. So, um, and camphor is registered as a weed, and, and it's and it's absolutely uh, noxious. Well, man, it's it's impossible to, to kind of um, control it. I mean, once they get going, and the birds bite one of the berries and, and drop one, you know, then up comes another um, uh, camphor with fertilizer, you know, with it, um, and they just multiply like crazy. So. Uh, we, that was a, a big thing for me looking for land up here was re recognizing the trees knowing what you're looking at because i was looking originally in kurabil up around there and and i realized that almost every property i looked at was all well, the only trees on it were camphor yeah, yeah. and then i realized uh oh okay uh and then I, I could see that was a bit of an issue so anyway and you've got some wonderful trees here and we were and you were showing off earlier about birds you're a bit of a twitcher <laughs> yeah. Are you? Well, thanks to <laughs> the Arnott's and uh, Charlie and Angelica, and actually uh, Tom and Emma Lane, uh, you guys jointly bought me a book for my birthday, That's which it. was a bird book mm -hmm. uh, to recognise all the species of birds up here. And it's my encyclopedia. I have it just sitting out here, and I have a set of binoculars, and I spend it. I like to spend, you know, if I can, at least an hour a day, just immersing myself in. 
observing what's going on around the trees mm. and listening to the, the sounds and then the changes in the weather and then the changes in the bird cycles and the noises the birds make and the sounds they make and at what times there's a flurry and a peak and then there's a bit of a drop off and then you find these unusual birds sort of coming through um you know while the the, the normal residents have, have gone elsewhere or, or they've quietened down it's really dynamic so um you know one of the original questions you had early on about land and, and everything was was I really wanted, uh, after years of being in, in uh, hotel rooms and, and airplanes and buses and cars and, you know, backstage waiting rooms and... and Confinement. Oh, just, you know, just mm. hours of waiting and, and having to psych yourself up to just remain uh, focused, you know, when things are being delayed or your two-hour flight's delayed and then, you you know, you've got a gig and you're going to be late. And all these sort of pressures. I really wanted to be around um, nature and to sort of just bathe the eyes in mm. god's work you know just look at the divine stuff that we all take for granted uh and um you can just hear those birds now i mean just let it sink in how incredible um god's technology is and don't discount it for a second that it's incredibly um advanced and for me being into sort of techie stuff and a bit of a nerd uh i've really Become extremely um, a lot more connected with nature because we're out here, and I think it's such a huge part of our existence, which has been purposely um, sort of stolen from our psyche through um, this brainwashing and this thought shaping, which television does to everybody. And so, being up here and just hearing, just hearing that the fluttering of the leaves in the background, that background noise mm. also helps me because I've got tinnitus. Tonight it's from, from here, yeah. damage from rock and roll music all my life. So that, well, that sound helps dim. It's kind of, it sort of over neutralizes it, yeah. a little bit of those mm. those peaking frequencies and, and up in the top end around about four k. So because I'm so close to cymbals that I'm hitting and, and the snare drum mm. and, and all the other equipment, um, it really affected my hearing. So uh, it would be very difficult. Um, to be in a quiet room because I just hear these, yeah. these non-stop noises. But out here, it's just, oh, it's just, just like, yeah, just bathing in, in God's glory. So it's beautiful. You can hear a nice uh, Hilux ute in the background. <laughs> which <laughs> That's adding to glorious the, as well. <laughs> it's adding to the, the white noise. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around The Kitchen Table, an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the Regenerative Journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash The Kitchen Table and we look forward to sharing a yarn with you. Now let's get back to this week's episode. Uh, was that one of your, your on your list? The the rest of those? I need I need I need white noise. I need background. Yeah, I need kind the, of trees. Sure. Rushing. Well, trees are important. No, I just want trees. Got a lot of trees, and we we we've always had. If we're lucky to have a house with, with a tree on it. You know, it would be a tree or two trees, but when you've got hundreds and hundreds of them, and mm. they're, they're just wild, and and it's not this is not a plantation. It's not a macadamia farm. This is these are just. Um, you know, this is an old dairy farm with with lots of beautiful old trees everywhere. Um, you made a good point there, Johnny, about the you're a techie guy, right? So techie is um, controlled. It, there's, there's there's rhythm. There's sort of um, there's a there's a yes a control and a and a a non natural. I mean, there's a natural beat and a natural tempo, which is you know right. um, which is a kind of not dissimilar to some of the you know, sounds and, the, and what's in nature. But mm. for a guy with a tech head, mm. right, from the city or from urban, yep. you know, non-country, yep. to then step into this and appreciate so much the beauty and, of nature and to immerse yourself in it. I mean, was that was that a natural thing? Did you have to force yourself into it? Was it like, oh, my God, I'm finally home. Oh, this yeah. is what I kind of have been missing for yeah. all these years? The latter. Um, it, it had been to the point where I had um, started to get, 
almost jumpy about just wanting to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it happened naturally. I mean, we, we'd, we called it a day of touring with an excess. Um, and uh, the last oh, show we did was in, uh, on November the 12th. Actually, that's a, that's almost a Delta last week, isn't it? This week. Um, it was at, uh, tw- no, 20, November 12th, 2012 in Perth entertainment center. That was the new entertainment center. And, uh, um, Elton John played the first gig the night or two nights before and we played the second one and that was our last show um but who was the, uh, remind who's the lead singer then it was well, we had kieran gribben and yeah. kieran and i have been working together uh, on our own uh, project called jack music j-a-c which is the acronym for john and kieran kieran's irish and kieran spelled with a c so uh kieran yeah came in for the last year and just help us sort of fold the touring mm. in a way that was um you know uh, with some dignity and respect and, and uh, enabled us to, to perform, um, you know, our repertoire uh, with a musician singer, not a lead singer. Mm. He was a guy who had a guitar and he was a great singer and he was able to put his guitar down and, and you know, try and do some, some lead singer moves and stuff. But effectively, he's a musician, you mm. know, as well. And that was very different, have mm. a guy at the, at the um, vocal station with a guitar on. Yeah, yeah, um, and there were already four guitars, you know. Sometimes, because so. I let me in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, which was good, actually. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed that. So, Kira and I kept close, and we had a few years where we kind of did our own thing. Because obviously, there was a, a post touring sort of uh, dismantling mentally, mm. spiritually, and everything else. Physically, um, I also um, had uh, a real alcohol problem. And uh, after years of touring and after Michael passed away and everything, it just got out of control. And, and uh, so I was hitting the booze pretty badly. And, and um, uh, At that 2011-12? Uh, uh, t- t- 2008 was when I, mm. I just had to pull pull stumps and just uh. go, I'm done. Uh, it was at the birth of my daughter, Avani, and um, I just recognised that... Done um, with the grog. Oh, man, it, it was mm. uh, it was really brutal and a uh, really scary place to be. Um, I was very close to death um and so recognized that uh that had run its course i wasn't like i was enjoying a beer if i didn't have one i'd, I'd go into you know kind of real um you know body would shut down so i was recognized that if i didn't wake up and have a drink yeah. you know i'd start to uh, convulse you know basically really? so um at that point i was you know um late 40s and i just stopped immediately and that was it never had a drink since Mm. and don't miss it whatsoever so that was really wonderful having uh, um, uh, a wife um, who was extremely supportive and uh, you know gave me some incredible wiggle room to get around that you've done well there mate yeah, thanks and, Kerry. and your carry mm. uh, is just absolute godsend and mm. um, you know so blessed um, a wonderful partner like Kerry but also she's an extraordinary uh, gifted mother and, and very uh, dedicated um, yeah, mum. So it's turned out pretty darn good. She's tops. Um, Your tops too, mate. I just want, I want to look at the because you could have you did buy this farm yep. and you made it your home. You could have gone to the local ag and vet fuller and gone, "What do I do?" Well, you got to spray those bloody cotton right. bushes out, and you got to you know round up all that camphor, and you got to do this and do this. And I don't know that you actually did any of that. Mm. Why not? Well, I did. Uh, oh, I, so what what happened was um, we found this property. It was um, an old dairy farm that someone would have loved and had worked very hard. You can see that it was all set up. Um, mm-hmm. And if I could start to speak a little farm vernacular, I might be way off. You correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Give um, me a shot. Man. <laughs> is is the dairy we have just over there? Mm. Uh, had a wagon wheel set up where all the fences um, all led to that that dairy. So mm. um, they, they call it wagon wheel fence line. So. No matter which paddock you're in, you can always round, you know, your, your, your uh, heads up to that, that towards the dairy. So I had to figure out and back engineer why this farm is set up the way it was. I had no idea why any fence was where it was. Mm. All the grass was easily as tall as I am, and I'm just, you know, under six foot. Um, so I had to spend about eight grand to get a guy to slash for 12 days or more, just so I could see what the hell so it, it is, you know. Um, and once I could uh, establish and analyze what's happening, 
um, I realized the first thing I need to do is buy a tractor because at that sort of money, um, it's just foolish not to. And it was a great excuse to buy a tractor. <laughs> what colour is it? Green. Green. Oh, it Johnny, still is. Johnny yeah. Deere. Uh, no, I didn't even join D. Actually, I looked at I looked at everything. I'm not so into that. I ended up with Deutsche Far. Oh right, okay. That's so, right. and uh, so what we did was uh, started to recognise that there was lots of um, campus saplings. Like I mean, thousands of them. Mm. And I'm looking at this going, how do we get this under control? Of course, I started to slash some of it, and of course, they grew back better. I'm going, come on, give me some more of that. You know. Like they're just Do your actually biggest. done a Chinese accent because actually from China. <laughs> I don't know why I went for Scottish one there. Um, sorry, Scottish. <laughs> camphor is from yeah, it is from China, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> made in China, and yeah, um, the camphor blanket boxes. Yeah, well, I mean, when I lived in Hong Kong, the first thing you do is go um, and buy a camphor chest because mm. uh, um, it's just a classic kind of. It's what you do? <laughs> we've got, we've got, <laughs> Mum and Dad have got two. We've got two, yeah. and, and they're all carved. In, yeah. Ornate, exactly. oriental. And you lift up and you go, whoa, there's a big camphor pong when you open yeah, up your lid. And then we put the blankets and everything wool in there because obviously the, the skittles right. and moths don't like yeah. camphor. But, but so, well, I'm always trying to think of ways to turn camphor into some some great business um, mm. thing. But I don't know, still, it's it's not easy. But but look, we did do uh, um, a little bit. I'm hearing some funny audio yeah, stuff, isn't it? Don't know. Okay. You, you, you're, you're even over, over above your tinnitus, mate. You're, you're <laughs> far exceeding. Oh, it might be my, my mic. Is it? Is it not working now? No, it's just cutting in and out. I'm, I'm, I'll just check. Check your levels. <laughs> is that what you yeah, check your levels. Check your levels. No, it sounds like a <laughs> uh, um, a, a, a click. No, there's like some sort of anomaly happening with the compression. But anyway, um, what we oh, did was we looked at um, different methods of of trying to sort of um, just contain the camphor so that wouldn't wouldn't be spreading more than it already had spread, and a lot of that tactic came down to we had about three or four different uh, conservationists and, and and people regenerative and and um, different people come through um, to give us some advice on how do we you know get some of this um, yeah how do, you know how do we get rid of camphor and try to regenerate some of the natural um, bushland and everything so unfortunately uh, everyone seemed to be pointing towards this tapping which is drilling into the root of a tree mm. and injecting a tactical amount of um, roundup in it um, and we were vehemently against roundup or anything to do with um, glyphosate yeah, yeah, for obvious reasons but somehow we thought, well, let's give it a go. Actually, Kerry was vehemently against it. Um, and it was very successful in the, in the sense that we were able to tactically spot a particular tree or a group of trees, and that was it. So you tap them, and over a period of time, they'd slowly die, and then they'd just fall and rot, and then mm. you're done. But it's not that easy, because the more research we did on uh, Roundup and glyph glyphosate mm. is that um, and Kerry said to me once, I wish we'd never done that. And, and I kind of agree with her now mm. that I, I wish I hadn't uh, consciously chosen to do my part in putting horrible, disgusting toxins in the planet. And so I'm extremely disappointed and even um, ashamed to even say that publicly. But hey, it's the truth, you know. Um, and, and so what happened while we had everything under control, I suddenly went, well, I'm not going to do that anymore because you know, this stuff's just evil, and mm -hmm. it really is. Um, but there's no other way that anyone seems to know about of how to control camphor. So now I'm just looking over there and just seeing all these camphors sort of starting to grow. Are they starting to come back? They're down over that hill down there. It's mm -hmm. just, anyway. But Well, the one, one trick is, and I'm no expert, is one trick is if you're going to remove them, then one must, one could, replace them with something because the camphors just go, bare ground, bare ground, I'm up again. Because right. I think they're introduced... And they thrived here as an introduced species because when they were introduced, there was a lot of clearing going on. So right. a lot of the, the natural um, layers of vegetation, the understory, the midstory, and overstory, that was removed at different stages. Yep. Um, and the camphor just went, I mean, I think its job on this planet is to cover stuff up. Yeah, right. And it's just gone, bare ground, I'm going to have a crack. And so um, I've heard now a number of stories where um, farmers have gone through, landowners up here have gone through and removed camphor and they've put immediately in 
something that's going to be quick growing. It might be a grass. Right. Also, then a, sh- a quick growing shrub, and then some longer term species as well. So you've got competition, and the campers kind of going, mm, okay, you kind of got this covered. I might just put a few of me out here, so you yeah. have less. And instead of this competition, and then where uh, one fellow I know, Martin Royds, he's got a block up here. He did have. He put a lot of. <clears throat> he did a lot of clearing. He did a lot of. Um, rainforest revegetation in, in, in his block, and he was actually then noticing the campers were dying. You're right. And he hadn't. He'd stopped round up. He, I don't think he'd ever round up actually in 20 years. And he just noticed that it was almost like they're going, oh, okay, I don't need to be here anymore. This is all cases. Um, that's you know? all, that's awesome to hear that. And and look, I I welcome any um, sort of holistic wisdom. Um, and again, just hearing you say, say that, I, I feel just terribly. Um, disappointed that we'd, we'd even used, even on a tactical level, uh, I'm just talking, it would have been this n- small little mm, injections here, and squirts mm-hmm. here and there, but it's still, still a squirt is, is something I wish we hadn't done. But, but look, and, and also your question was about, you know, there's cotton weed, there's, um, you know, Scot- um, Scottish thistle, mm. you know, there's fire weed. I mean, there's all these different types of weeds. And I remember one of the first times you and I met, you came to have a look at the property and we drove around and I was going, look at these weeds and look at that thing there. And you know, that, that's got to go. And, and you're like, yeah, well, depends on what you want. You know? <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking, why is he being so sort of like, why isn't he coming out with these big, you know, bazooka and just like, nuke and everything. And, and I realized that, uh, that the mindset was part of the journey for me was to understand that, Hey, it's, it's, it's all an attitude and it's a, it's, um, a way that you look at things is what I, the takeaway I got from our first meeting was, uh, was exactly what you said, as I can recall. Look, if you wanted manicured pasture, then you've got your tractor and you can go slashing and, and you get that look if that's what you want. Or, you know, you can look at something um, uh, in a way that the weeds are there for a reason and figure out why they're growing. What is it that the universe is, is why is it, is it attracting these to grow? And I, and I realized that's right up my alley, that, that style of thinking. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. And so from then I went, ah, oh, and I kind of totally changed my perspective on um, instead of judging and being narrow-minded about uh, looking at something and going, oh, that's acceptable, but that isn't uh, in terms of nature, um, then you realize that what we've done collectively over a long period of time to this planet and to the wildlife and to ourselves, psychologically, physically, and, uh, and emotionally, um, it's a wonder we're here at all. <laughs> and on that basis that we're lucky anything's growing as well you know and that just to maybe sit back and have a think about why it's doing what it's doing why is that bird there and why is that tree there what made it grow what helped it grow and why is that one dying you know mm-hmm. uh and so it's a it's a big and that's just to say on a philosophical side of things as well as a practical side of farming but i'm really interested more on the the takeaway spiritually than I am for anything else. And that's my entire sort of takeaway from all of this experience is just enjoying the journey and learning about what happens, uh, the outcomes of things, um, and even the way you think or what you do physically with the land and, and what responsibility you have to sometimes choose between maybe letting it go just because you should let it just be what it wants to be and, or your intervention is because you want the outcome that you want, which might be a unrealistic agenda, or it could be um, both, you know, you, you, and now I'm sort of integrating that my outcome should be that it should be pretty uh, functional and harmonious and balanced. And while I know that it won't be because we've got thousands of years of, 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 of clearing up to do, um, but enjoying the balance and harmony that, that's present in this moment because that's where we are and that's, that's, what, that's, that's how we, we adapt and overcome. That's, it's a big paradigm shift though, isn't it? It is and it's a wonderful, it's, a, it's the best gift that, that we've ever given ourselves and, um, and um, if, if I don't start the day um, thanking our divine creator uh, for this wonderful gift, then, you know, I, yeah. I've got to remind myself to constantly mm. check in all the time. 
And when I drove in, I had a bit of a scan as a farmer. I can't. <clears throat> Angelica, um, she says I'm just decided. I spend more time with my head sideways driving than I do forward <laughs> because I'm always checking out paddocks and farmers and machinery and sheds. And it's like I'm just fascinated with yeah. how how, um, how it is. So I couldn't help yeah. it, but get this get the get the the crane my neck sideways, <laughs> and it looks fantastic. Oh, you thanks, know, it's yeah. not like overrun with thistles or weeds or no, okay. even with a sort of a critical, you know. Objective mindset, yeah. Sure. Um, for you, it's, it's, it looks fantastic. Well, Charlie, you taught me so much. Um, I mean, one of the first things you did when we were driving around um, on the property was we looked at some thistle, we looked at some cotton weed, we we're looking at some fireweed, and we we're looking at some farmers' friends. And 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 um, you said, um, look, you know, uh, if I can try to paraphrase somehow. <laughs> um, uh oh, here we go. Uh, that that whatever went on here before um that the ether the atmosphere the the soil health and all of that holistically is drawing the somehow the universe and the earth is expressing itself in the in the way that it, it needs to express itself and so i look at those weeds now as more like an indicator than an enemy or a threat, mm. you know, and, that, and I changed my perspective on looking at going, oh, the dang weed, you know, from, from being sort of, you know, almost um, embarrassed to have a paddock full of fireweed going, you know what, it's okay. It's just fireweed. It's accumulating phosphorus. That's all right. That's good. Yeah. And so I kind of went, you know what, and then I'll let the paddocks just, yeah, just, just grow back mm. and I wasn't slashing. And I just, just let them grow and let's get some animals back in there and, and, and habitat for birds. And, and so now I find as the years roll by, I just slash a, a few paddocks around near the, the homestead and the rest of it just can be wild and crazy and do what it wants. You've got cattle on? Yeah. Yeah. But I pulled most of them off when we had that um, extended drought up here anyway, northern rivers, I mean, which is normally just absolutely ridiculously green and lime green lush. Um, we were going brown. I mean, we were crispy. We were walking along crispy, crispy. paddocks. And it was like... Was that, was um, when was, was that last? It was, was 20, uh, end of 2018. Not, Sorry, yeah. end of 2019 19, was when yeah. we first saw so the rain. It was widespread. And, yeah. and we had about sort of 25 to 30 head. Um, and uh, once I figured out the vernacular with what head means, as I just <laughs> assumed we were talking about an animal, uh, but course it's it's cut up into more complexity than that we would have had uh with the with the mums and the calves and the one bull probably up to just under 50 yeah it's fair, and then fair then fair. then we took which is probably about as the max you could run on on the small size property and then i just asked the guy who is adjusting and um i i chose to have someone to adjust because i just didn't really want to worry about all that side of it after watching my brothers do it uh, i love cows i love looking at them i love eating them um but i just don't really want to have to be a cow roadie um so i just asked the guy who was um adjusting to kindly leave the smallest group of animals that, that they could sustain as a family and a tribe mm. without it being too strange mm. and so i think we got it back down to about nine or 10 or 12 mums, I think. So mm. we're kind of up around the 18 now. animal mark. Yeah. 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 Like that. You probably, you probably, and that's great. They pop, yeah. they pop in and out every now and then mm. and they come up the trough and have a drink and I love seeing them. Do you name them? <laughs> no. Well, the kids mistake. started, but, but no. I mean, they, 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 I don't think they could recognize if it's <laughs> four black cows. I think they, you know, they're not into, identification at this point but um we were naming when we first got here because it was it was novel you know novel, it was ducks totally. in the pond and ducks in the dam and and there were you know wild animals and we started to name them and, but now we've got two little uh little puppies and that's changed everything um in particular just around the house because you would get a lot of snakes up here right. and um that that's something which was a bit of a um uh yeah a bit of a wake-up call for uh, the kids and Kerry um, was that we're now having to be snake savvy, you know, 
you walk out of the house, so you got to look around, you got to check where you're walking and what you're doing. And I spent a lot of my time through, you know, the, the, the farm and, and through the bush and, and trees, and I encounter a lot of, 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 um, of snakes. But because we brought these two little puppies, suddenly it wasn't acceptable to have a little python or a big python around the garden. Well, I used to love pythons around the garden mm. uh, because one of them ended up um, – in oh, the in the jaws of, I of you the puppies, that story. yeah, ended up, yeah. Well, but you saved you. I, stepped in. I just wasn't even thinking. I had no shoes on, and I could hear the screaming outside. And uh, I thought, you know, it was one of those screams where I thought one of the kids had mm. died or mm. something. It was absolutely horrible, and so I ran out, going, "What?" You know, Kerry's screaming. I had no boots on or anything, and um, I'm checking, look around to see if uh, my son had something happened to him and he was standing there and he was screaming and I'm like okay what is going on and no one could sort of tell me uh, and then I noticed that one of the puppies was there and I went ah oh, where's the other one mm. and then I, as I looked around I could see in the garden there was this little sort of dog's butt and tail with this huge big um, snake wrapped around it as it was constricting mm. you know, the life out of this thing and I realized now why my wife, Kerry, was, was just screaming because she felt so helpless. And she was trying to find something to, you know, fight the snake with. And at that moment, I, I knew if I just didn't go and walk over there and pick the whole mess up mm. and just untangle it, that we're going to end up with a dead. Which I actually thought, I actually thought the dog was dead already. Mm. I thought, okay, all I'm trying to do here now is give it some dignity, yeah. get it out of the mouth and around the, the, the clutches of this huge python. And just at least to give it a nice burial, um, but the whole whole affair was quite traumatic uh, for the dog and for everyone watching, including me. But I ended up having to swing this thing round with a dog attached to the <laughs> snake's mouth. Did you and have did you have it by the tail? I kind of picked it, uh, the whole thing up. I yeah. picked the whole mess up, <laughs> and I knew the snake because I'd seen it around. I'd been around a lot. We had guinea pigs too, and quite often there'd be a snake next to the guinea pig hutch. But the twain were we're just buddies, you know. No, I was always surprised that there wasn't a guinea pig missing. There was always a snake going, how you doing? You know, yeah, hi, saying, no, we're I'm fine. It's all good. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking this is a really, really like it's out of character, per perfect place we're in. So anyway, I, I grabbed the, um, the snake and I started to try to untangle it. And I, wow, I learned really quickly how strong those things are mm -hmm. and how difficult it was to tr pry the, the rounds and the, and the, the winding of the snake. So what I ended up doing is having to, swing it round like a lasso and mm. try and just have inertia untangle the yeah. snake away from the dog so the dog was was in the mouth of the snake oh. so like, <laughs> like whipping it round then i started slamming it on the ground to try and get <laughs> if the dog wasn't dead before i'm thinking i'm gonna kill it just by mm. the sheer brutality that is, is, is anyway it's a total mess you know i had a knife on me which i wasn't going to introduce into the fight because what's the point i mean <laughs> because once there was blood around i mean um i you know wouldn't know whose blood it was and that's going to be slippery mm. and messy and horrible so mm, i point. just went i'm just going to go in i'm just going to unravel this thing and slowly um got it so the point as i was swinging it around i kept banging it down onto the grass that the snake let go of the dog finally and and it, and the dog flew about 10 meters uh, over the trampoline, which I thought would have been perfect if the dog had landed yeah, on the trampoline on and it. bounced off. Meant to do that. It was meant to do that. <laughs> and it missed the trampoline by about 300 mil or something. And then the snake turned around and bit me on the hand, which was yeah, great because then I knew then that the dog was was off. Out of yeah. It. So as soon as I felt that, that shearing pain, I knew I was the, the, the dog was okay. Was it, quite, was it, was it a hard um, – I've never been bitten by a yeah, dog. Yeah, I was surprised. Um, yeah. It hurt like shit. And uh, no fangs, just a no, it was well, it's kind of got these um real curled fangs yeah, in it. Yeah. So when it got onto my hand and I was swinging and, and moving it around, all I was doing was just agitating the mm. fangs in my hand, and I was developing the the um um the the, the um lacerations mm. because it was all this kerfuffle. If I was just sort of you know zenned out like a yogi, it would have been different because there was this frenetic kind of trauma. Uh, I, I made it worse by mangling my hand inside this, 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 this big snake and it weighed a lot. And there was that moment when we had a fencing contractor down here doing some fencing and he ran up, he heard all this screaming and noise just at this moment where I'd just gotten the dog out of the, out of the, the python's face mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had the python on the ground and Kerry had taken the dog and was running up 
to, to nurse it. And I was standing here with the snake going, right, <laughs> you know, what are we going to do with you? And he came up and he goes, don't hurt the snake. <laughs> and and um, I kind of backhanded the snake like, well, there's one for me. Uh, and then I then I just took the snake and put it somewhere else. I didn't kill yeah, it. I didn't want to kill it because I really like them. I think they're, they're really cool. Yeah, so and he was just getting a feed. It was just, I mean, it was just doing what it does, and the puppy was doing what a puppy does, and the puppy was just sniffing around and, and followed a trail. Next thing you know, it was in the clutches of, of. So that's the type of experience that, that you know we're learning to to you know as a normal everyday thing that happens around here is mm. is some some wildlife interaction with with our domestication. The trials and tribulations, mate. We could we could always pepper those snakes. You yeah, I thought about course. that, and um, along the way, after some um, wisdom that was shared by you and Hamish about peppering, um, I've now got a very interesting uh, freezer full of all sorts of things. <laughs> Make sure <laughs> that it doesn't get turned off. Okay, I know, I know. Well, exactly. <laughs> uh, with all these power cut outages we get around here, I'm th always thinking, with what is Check in that, that drawer over there, uh, right. everything from. Um, some uh, mangled brown snake I found somewhere to Good. some rats and mice. And we're even thinking about doing it to cane toads mm. because now the puppies come outside and they go looking for these mm. cane toads. They, they want anything that stinks and it's bad for them. Then and poisonous, and poisonous, you know, so cane toads are pretty bad stuff. Mm. Um, well, we can do that too. I did that video on it uh, right. this year okay. um, and did it last full moon. Actually, there was a full moon last right. night. Um, before, just last question on farming, and we'd probably better wrap that up. We've we've punched out uh, a minute seventeen, a minute, an hour seventeen, Johnny. Oh, cool. Um, subtle energy, subtle energy. It's stuff. good. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Good stuff. I love it. <clears throat> Tell us about your, if you will, the, your experience with with that. Well, um, while I'm you know actively practicing um, my own version of you know spiritual discipline uh i'm not following any particular tenor of of you know um religion so to speak but i'm very spiritual um and where i've had a, a great deal of experience with subtle energies with music and uh interacting with people through the joy of of and power of music is that you, you tap into the subtle energies with that and that expression and that that fellowship that it brings. But um, subtle energies can work in so many realms and, and it's because we're so disconnected to our own divine source that we look at even the discussion of subtle energies as some wacky out there kind of concept when actually it's the opposite. The fact that we're so disconnected from subtle energies is, is a pure example of, of our uh, how we've, you know, become wayward we've, we've lost our way because we've been tantalized and um in my view you know um and bedazzled with all sorts of worldly um distractions that we that we've got every excuse possible to us to explain why we're not um focusing on subtle energies or even aware of them um when they are exactly the whole purpose of uh, our being here is, is what I believe. Uh, and so on that basis, I really love um, picking up on the finer nuances of, of when I'm being spoken to by nature or when there's a tap on the shoulder very, very subtly about a moment or how I'm handling a situation with my children, which is usually quite badly, you know, just because <laughs> there's so much... Um, baggage that we hold from generations and generations of, of dysfunction mm. that I, I'm just trying to pick up on recognizing those moments and going, okay, here's, a, here's an opportunity for me to recognize it, change my course, or just, just be aware of it even, mm. you know. Um, but look, I mean, I love nature. Um, I, I just love hearing all these birds around me all the time and, and just getting into that alone um helps me connect with um the divine creator and divine source which therefore everything um starts to evolve around that i mean um my farming choices the day i might 
choose to go out and do something to, to the farm, it feels like the right day to do it. It feels like the right time, you know. And if my heart has the right intent, then I feel that there's going to be some synergy and that's why I'm called to do it and not be too hard on myself if I feel like maybe now's not the right time for that, even though I need, it, I know it needs to be done, mm. but, I, but I won't do it unless I feel like I'm in the right frame of mind to do it, mm. if that makes sense. Oh. Um, and that's a liberty, really. I mean, because if I was, and this is a hobby farm, it's not a farm of, we're not farming uh, as a livelihood. This is a lifestyle. So therefore I'm, I'm speaking just purely um, about uh, how fortunate we are to have that liberty. But, you know, we're not, we're not farming chickens, you know, we're not farming uh, macadamias. Um, but, but there is land and there is, for me, um, an importance to maintain um, a balance that I can appreciate and feel. And, and, and also, Charlie, there's so much you've brought into my life uh, that I have to just recognize uh, with the subtle en energies is having a, a sort of a spiritual agent like someone like Kim Kiss uh, who um, I can call and who can remotely um, check in with the property and, and give me some updates on its energy and how it's going and, and, uh, and the woo-woo side of things, which I absolutely love. And, uh, and, and actually, interestingly enough, I actually will speak to a remote viewer uh, in Canada a couple of months ago who was also viewing the property from Canada. And uh, it just goes to show you it really doesn't really matter about the location of, of someone who's got the ability or the mm -hmm. talent to remote view or to pick up on subtle energies as, as a um, practice mm. um, to be elsewhere. So, you know, although we flew Kim in to initiate the property when we finished building the house and, and I wanted her to just do a clearing and have the family kind of in That's a right. circle and do a little bit of a, not so much a ceremony, but just just sit around and be grateful and, and just have some affirmations and, and some intent to um, to give gratitude to the land and, and thanks to all the energies and all the spirits that live here and, mm. and past and present and um, in the future and, and um, also the indigenous um background of what would have been going on here for thousands of years and, and which kim, and, kim yeah. would have tapped into exactly <clears throat> and, and i felt i really wanted to and um, just to know if we were what we were walking into uh because it's all very well to look for property but i wanted to know that am, am i buying some piece of land that that is sacred to someone or, or you know I, I didn't want to interfere with that mm. at all it's quite a responsibility isn't it that mm. there's tens of thousands of years of history and <clears throat> emotional overlay and residual stuff that um, we, without thinking about it and tapping into the subtle energy side of it, um, can can be um, an ongoing detrimental kind of a, an energy yeah. you know, on a farm or a family or a business operating in, in that space. Yeah, and I learnt, exactly, Charlie, and I learnt already from Kim that we had this issue with water um, mm -hmm. because during the whole build, which took three years um we we didn't have water on site we had um one ibc thousand liter tank on a trailer that i had custom built in victoria with a honda davy fire pump so that at least i had some way of handling fire mm. and we could deploy water around and we were talking thousand liters that we just sucked from the dam with a honda davy pump and that would be what we used for the building site and i would have that deployed wherever it needed to be to tend to any burning off we were doing or have it ready in case there was a fire but just to have water to to to, to um start to you know give bring water to plants that we were and trees and saplings that we were, we were planting and and it took a long time to get water connected and i couldn't figure out what the hell was the problem uh we had issues and there was certain relationships which failed and um you know there was just this like felt like pushing the proverbial up the hill. I couldn't Lock, figure out what is going mm, on mm. with the water. I, I don't understand it. And then Kim said, oh, you've got an issue with the water warrior. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, well, what That's have I cool. done? What did I do? And yeah. she says, no, it's just sort of been there for a while and we need to just be a bit, you know, um, aware that it needs some finessing and, and to try to appease the water warrior, uh, which was 
uh, which interesting now I've, I've learned what she was sort of saying uh, on a uh, more defined basis because down there where the dam is, what I realized is that the spring had moved. And so the dam wasn't being fed by the spring, but the spring was popping up somewhere else. And there's cows kept sort of going over there and sloshing around. I went looking around, what is going on here? Like, you know, there's all the sloshy mud and stuff and the cows are all just sort of hanging around there all the time. Um, I realized that the spring had moved and popped up somewhere else. And I also noticed recently uh, that someone told me that, that uh, and this could, you could correct me if you know better, um, the indigenous um, uh, locals looked at the water warrior as a space for women, not for men. Okay. Yeah. And so I had these guys trying to do water work um, here and the water warrior wasn't liking it. And what I found out recently that locally from what, some of the local guys is that it's a sacred place for women mm. and it needs to be a woman's job. That's that's the that's the deal. Yeah, yeah but right. but that's something I heard from someone else uh, that totally not related to Kim whatsoever. But mm. I might talk to Kim about that and say, look, what, what's your advice uh, and energy? What are you reading on this? Because uh, I'd like to try and capture that spring somehow, but I don't want to interfere with uh, messing with the energy of something because it's hey, Johnny Farris's agenda is to go and you know scrape around and and and, and scratch around and try and you know. Um, capitalize on this 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 spring mm. when it this spring might have its own plans and I, I have to remember that it's not my spring you know uh -huh. i'm just a uh custodian of where i'm living uh which is tied up in a bunch of bullshit dentureship uh and it probably turns out i don't even own it at all <laughs> the more i learn about <laughs> yeah, what's going on in the real world yeah, right <laughs> that's another conversation you know exactly so i'm just saying and you're a man so you're not allowed to <laughs> yeah. stuff with but the water. i'm off the hook already no that's it so well i mean it makes sense if kim can do the negotiations and the, right. and the conversation there as a woman on behalf of right then that may be that may be the way well maybe it is and and uh, so i wanted to appease all the energies here and i do often uh talk to all the uh, energies on the on the property and i'm always um making myself um known to the bird life and the ground life and and the air and the ground that we're blessed to be here and thank you for having us and um you know we we try to tread lightly but we we apologize for anything we've done which is untoward but that it was done out of ignorance and we try to learn the best we can and and uh, make up for our shortcomings by trying to be aware and conscious um and i think that consciousness is so important through and through so i mean i understand really that's the premise of this discussion for me is to is to get across to the listener that um and no matter what you're doing and any exchange you're having at any point in your life is there for a reason and that consciousness that opportunity to 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 be able to recognize everything that's happening whether it be good or bad or however you perceive it or judge it is meant to be and try to always turn it around a positive outcome which is your outlook that just changed that one what happened there my, my thing just have you lost them i don't know what happened there hello can you hear that it's not cutting in and out no it? it's not oh. it's, it's just gone really quiet hang on what am i sorry viewers listeners oh, that's a bit that's one up. i've got to get this in service mate, <laughs> what a, that, that yeah. was that was profound mate that's that's that, that and i think we leave it there because mm. that's awesome what i'm going to ask you to do johnny is um we'll we'll finish this up and i'm just going to hit you up for another five minutes and it's just i do these rapid fire questions okay and it's just quick short sharp sure. you can you know yes no's or whatever and we'll keep it brief and those rapid fire questions and answers will be available to our patreon members who are our wonderful um uh, around the kitchen table crew and they they support the podcast every month and um we give them bonus content oh so you're going to be the johnny you're going to be the bonus content have you ever been have you ever been bonus content before <laughs> i don't i'm sure at some <laughs> capacity at some, at some uh, party you were probably bonus i've content. been content <laughs> with, with a bone and a bonus <laughs> so mate, we'll wrap it up there for those who want to hear what john has to say later after this then um get on patreon get to my <laughs> website charlieheart.com.au and sign up and listen for more bonus content <laughs> Find out, find out what John's bonus content looks like. 
<laughs> Maybe I better have a look before we, <laughs> anyone else does. Uh, thanks, thanks, everybody. Mate. And thank you, Charlie. That was awesome. Thanks, mate. Well, that sees the end of season four of the Regenerative Journey. Uh, lovely to have, for, for Johnny Farris to have taken us out. Uh, the end of the year, uh, and what a year it's been. It's kind of crazy, um, full of opportunity, I think. Uh, you know, one could take a very um, pessimistic line about the year, but I'm actually quite optimistic about uh, what it has created for next year. That might sound a bit crazy, but I think it's, you know, um, it does present opportunities, believe it or not. Uh, and hopefully that was touched on in some way um, with, our, with the interviews with Johnny and, and previous um, two parts with Adam, Adam Gibson. On to season five next year, we have a ripper. We've got some fantastic initiatives and sponsors coming on board. Um, it's, <laughs> we're gonna, I'm not sure we're going to start. Um, it might be late February. Um, so it's going to be, we're going to take a bit of time out, well, well earned rest and recovery for the, for the team. And talking about the team, I just want to say a big thank you to um, Reese, who's, who doesn't do a lot of editing of the actual interview, which is, which is, which is our kind of the way we do it. Um, but he's a master, he's a magician of top and tailing. I think that's the right word. He plugs it all together and does a fantastic production uh, work on the interviews. Um, also, uh, Fiona, she's amazing. She keeps me on track. She's all a lot of the behind the scenes um, activities and getting things, <laughs> getting, getting me, getting me on track and keeping the ship sailing or steered, steered in the right direction. Alex gave us a lot of help with. Um, uh, with collateral and um, and marketing this season, season four. So thank you, Alex, for that. Big thank you to my family who, you know, obviously doing these interviews takes me away from um, takes me away from them a lot of the time. And um, they're very patient, um, very loving, and very supportive of, of what we do. And they know uh, know why I why I do it and and, and why I have to go away and talk to people, <laughs> um, which I so enjoy doing. And a big thank you to all our listeners. Um, for you, you know, well, I mean, this is this is for you guys. It is. It's about helping you start or continue progress your regenerative journey. Get you inspired about not just agriculture, but food, farming, and those who actually produce the food you eat, and sourcing that, and health, and a whole lot of other uh, you know things. There's not much that you can't kind of um, take back to personal health and happiness. And our Patreon members, favourite people in the world who have um, volunteered, so to speak, there um, to support us every month in various ways. And we very much appreciate and are very grateful to our Patreon members. But it's not too late. If you want to sign up for Patreon, do so. Jump on my website, charliearnett.com.au, and join the team. We'll be doing a few little webinars throughout the uh, festive season, I'm not sure about January, but certainly we are, um, we'll, be, we'll be doing one in December, I think, I think I'm right in saying that, but nonetheless, it's good value, I reckon, and um, anyone who wants to join in, but we are very much appreciative of our Patreon members, they are absolute legends. That's pretty much it, looking forward to joining you all again, uh, bringing you some amazing uh, stories and journeys of people uh, in season five, and we're going to finish season four with a wonderful song from Johnny uh, and his mate, Kieran Gribben, who was the uh, last lead singer um, in 2012 uh, for In Excess when they played in Perth there, their final gig. Uh, it's called We Are Awakening. It's a wonderful song, very appropriate for our times, and uh, here it is, and fantastic. We can finish season four with this wonderful song. Have a restful, festive season, and we'll see you on the other side. Last night I was ready to fight to the right I know that's the way back home I say we can bring this to light stand up and get on this flight uh, goodbye to the darkness now I hear the light the TV will say
This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.